in, you know, and so that's cool. Welcome in the mighty name of Jesus to Cool Ministries Incorporated. I'm Pastor Boyd Harrell coming to you from 5005 West 34th Street in Northwest Houston, Texas at Cool Headquarters. We appreciate you dialing in today. Thank you for liking, sharing, subscribing to the page. And thank you, Covenant Partners. You know, thank you for sending in prayer requests, praise reports, and, and for all of the prayers that you pray for the success of reaching out to those that are lost and hurting and that need to get saved in our community and in the prisons and jails now because the doors are reopened. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we've been making our rounds, and it's been a very, very uh, wonderful blessing. And then we still want you to agree with us now. We want everybody viewing to agree with us right now. We have a pastor and a beautiful wife uh, together, a team, that want to get back in there. And we just pray right now for the, the power of God's grace and mercy and divine favor to just manifest mightily upon Pastor Bill and Stephanie to be able to get back to the place where God called them to be to serve his kingdom behind those walls. Father God, now we call this in by faith. We pray supernatural divine blessings upon our brother Jason and his wife Angie and bringing him back where he needs to be right here in the, in the cool house, Father God, in the cool witness worship team and everything that concerns their life, their livelihood, their health, and their well-being. It's in Jesus' name that we lift up every soul, every person who struggles in their addiction, no matter what it's to, alcohol, prescription medication, methamphetamines, cocaine, opiates, heroin, whatever the case may be. We pray for every hurting soul that is addicted to drugs and alcohol that they can break free by decision that enough is enough and then draw in strength and power, grace and mercy and favor from the Lord himself to get them through and over the hump and get it settled out once and for all. No turning back. Clean and sober life from here on. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said amen and amen to that. Um, we are going to have a wonderful evening of worship. Now, we've been talking about this, and we just, you know, we had the video uh, shown in a different segment here, but we just want to make sure that you're aware that we are having an intimate evening of worship on Friday, April the 30th from 7 to 10 p.m., and we hope if you're in the Houston area that you can come. Then we have a special video we wanted to show you today concerning Saturday, May 8th, which is uh, our first annual uncontainable uh, one.org cool event. And of course, whether uncontainable1.org is with us on the second annual or the third annual, that's neither here nor there. We're going to do something for the king. Can I get a witness? And we're going to have food. We're going to have some hamburger plates, and we're going to have some brisket. We just got word from our brother Andy Valadez, the guy that blows the shofar and uh, carries a sidearm everywhere he goes. Amen. We, we appreciate him and his service to our country and his love for country and king and king and country. And so anyway, he's going to do some barbecue, and we're going to have that in the house. That's going to be good. And then we're going to also have a, uh, a well, let's just roll the video. That, that ought to be good. Amen. Let's do that.
So hallelujah to that. Well done, by the way. And we also, here at headquarters, we have a sign-up sheet. So it's getting passed around the room here for the people that are attending church this morning. But if you're watching us right here in the Houston area and say you're just a, a, th a, a th what do they say, a stone's throw away, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and drop by and see us and, and sign up and be a part of it. Amen. We'd love to have you, and we do appreciate you very much. Uh, yesterday, I got a phone call from the Lopez unit. And the chaplain out there, Chaplain Ramon Vila, has a little church there called, uh, it's uh, called Breathe Life Christian Church, and it's in Harlingen. And so we have a strong chapter of our cool recovery uh, ministry going on at the Lopez unit. And now we have a strong chapter fixing to come through at his church in Harlingen. And then our facilitator that's actually in the prison there at Lopez his, um, uh, how, do, how do these guys, how do, how do we saw his baby's mama? <laughs> uh, she is in, a, in another facility, and she is going to bring that to some broken women in the uh, Medina area. So, so look at God now. So we have strong chapters of this in Lovington, New Mexico. Now we have a strong chapter at the Clemens unit. We've got a strong chapter kicking off at the Bell unit. We're now we're adding Jester 3 to it. They've been watching the video for six months. How about that? Now they're going to get the books in the next week or two. And so um, it's starting to catch on. Now what's important for you to know about that is I, I just want to continue to covet your prayers that we can get the word out. This is a, um, it's a powerful take or teaching, if you will, on how so many of us just got all we could get out of the secular world in our recovery journey. And we decided, you know, maybe it would be nice to open our hearts to the Lord. I mean, he created everything after all, you know, and, and he is the lover of our soul and the lifter of our head. And it's the goodness of God that drew us to him and, and reaches out and gets us and takes hold of us. So let's go ahead and put Jesus in the center of it. And when we did that, we transitioned from a place of recovery, which we definitely needed that, to a place of restoration where we're washed in the blood, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we have power, power inside to, to deal with life on life's terms and still stay clean and still stay sober without getting so caught up in, in the drama. Oh, Lord, Jesus. there's so much drama in the game. Amen. My gosh, there's not a patent place, uh, a soap opera anywhere that could compare to the drama of the drug and alcoholic person, drug addicted and alcoholic person. I know because I was there for too long. And it tries to carry on over into the new life. I mean, you got to watch it. I tell you, you got to watch that devil. He's a slick foot. Amen. So praise God. So anyway, love you. I just want to get a few things out the way there. And I just, I, I just want to say thank you. You know, thank you for coming back to church. You know, it's so nice to have the house just begin to fill up again. It's just, I love what Stephanie said. It's just, it, it just brings such joy to your soul, you know, to see people coming back to church. Amen. And, and, uh, and we continue to believe God for safety and protection upon our health and our well-being. And we pray for uh, the people that did get the shot and those that didn't and, and, and people that got good, you know, good rapport from it and everything smooth sailing and those that got sick from it. We just pray for divine healing and, and protection and, and blessing upon our lives. We're not here to throw rocks at each other about nothing. Amen. We don't divide ourselves left and right. We, we know it's good and evil, you know, and, and, uh, and you can't slice and dice that no other way. It's just good and evil, amen, and, and God is good, and, and the devil evil, amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and you just get that cut, man. You just go ahead and stand your ground and, and, and fight that fight. Fight that good fight, amen. Come on with it. Do something different, amen. I'm so glad, you know, in four days... Four more days, if the good Lord allows me the grace to wake up, it will be 28 years since I wetted my whistle with a can of beer. Amen. It'll be 28 years since I got in trouble. Amen. Come on, somebody. Oh, man. That's, that's, it's, it's just, that's a miracle. That is a miracle for an old incorrigible old repeat offender. Come on, old hard-headed, stubborn old thing. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's a miracle. Amen. 
God is faithful. He's good. Amen. And so you don't know like I know what he done for me. Of course, I don't know like you know what he done for you either. Amen. So, so praise the Lord for all that. So around town, they say this often. They say about y'all, they say, man, they, those are some word people over there at that cool church, man. They sometimes they get whole chapters in a, in a single serving over there. Amen. So, uh, so welcome to cool church. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to wave our Bibles around. We're going to make God glad and the devil mad. Some of you will just throw your device up because you got that, got the multiple apps on there. Amen. And got every version they have on there. And uh, some of us just got, they got the, we got our word in our heart. Amen. Just throw your hand up and let's do it together. Let's say this together. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in this place today. It is just such an honor and a privilege to be in your presence, O oh God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Our prayer remains the same, none of us and all of you, for we must decrease and you must increase. We are very careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, all the time. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for drawing us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you, Father God, for giving us the ability to actually say and mean it in faith, and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We thank you, Father God. We give you praise and glory for forgiveness of sin and washing us in your blood and healing our bodies and touching our minds. I want to say thank you, Father, for on behalf of every one of us for the crown of thorns that Jesus took on his brow to give and secure for all of us mental health stability. Father God, I thank you, Father God, that everything that's supposed to happen chemical-wise in the natural effect of our brain power, Father God, I thank you that you would cause all of the chemicals to be enhanced that, that are supposed to be there, endorphins and serotonin levels and everything that makes us normal and righteous and good and blessed and sharp, Father God. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And we all said amen and amen. I tell you, we just can't pray enough specifically about things that we're all going through. Amen. We got to get on track with things. Amen. For every father that's got a child in trouble, for every mother that's got a child in trouble, we believe God right now to heal those children, to give them favor, to draw them out of darkness into his marvelous light, to help them and bless them. For every marriage that's going through any kind of trial, any kind of situation, we believe God for, for born-again marriages and healing in the homes. Amen. In Jesus' name. For those of us that might be grieving the loss of a loved one. You know, people are born and people die. And when people die that we love, it bothers us. It really, it really puts us in a position of grief and sorrow. Now, we don't grieve like those who have no hope, but we still grieve. Amen? And so I ask you, Father God, to comfort those that are going through any type of loss of life in their families, in their loved ones, Father God, in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it right now. We ask you to visit our family members that are in the hospital. If they're in the hospital, whatever hospital they're in, whatever program they're in, wherever they are in this world, we pray that you, Lord Father God, will visit them and heal their body and touch their mind. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said... Amen and amen. We thank God for all that he does. He gives us a second chance, a third, a fourth. I couldn't even tell you how many chances he's given me. And I tell you what, I'm so glad that he is like he is. Because he is the lover of your soul and the lifter of your head and the sustainer of your life. And there's no past in our future. Amen? amen? No past in our future. The enemy tries to use the past to hurt us and to cause us to be divided and, and to, to mess us up because he wants us to argue about it. Hello? He, he wants us to stay in a, in, a, in a down position over it. Look, just shake it off and step up and let the past go. Come on, somebody. The title of the message today is Self-Examination. And our foundational scripture will be found in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 40. And I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible first. This one verse, it says, let us test 
and examine our ways and let us return to the Lord. You know, we talk about that all the time around here, about returning to our first love. You know, it'd be one thing if nobody ever veered off, if nobody ever found themselves in a, in a bit of a trouble or any kind of a stressed out method, but that's just not the case. For, for all of us, we can really pretty much identify with people that, you know, hey, man, I veered off, I, I, stepped, I stepped wrong, I made the wrong decision, I did something I regret, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really messed up about this, amen? And then so God, he gives us the ability to what? Examine ourselves and test our ways, right? And return to our first love, which is what we all need to do. Matter of truth, whatever, what all the different things that happened to our world in 2020, the one thing that just came through more than anything for me was that God was saying, return to me. I'm your first love. And I saw and witnessed and experienced myself that people everywhere, I mean, there were fathers that were texting me and saying, man, I haven't been able to spend this much time with my kids in years. I am so enjoying just sitting down and spending time with my children, you know. I mean, people were quarantined, and, you know, we went through all that. And, and I mean, where, where the enemy, he thought he really had something really serious. Man, God used it. He used it and drew people up and called us up higher. And then some of us continue to struggle and get beat on even some more. And that's real too. Amen. That's real as well. But some of that's because we don't examine ourselves. We're not allowing the light of Christ to penetrate those dark areas so that we can, you know, embrace his truth and embrace his power. Can I get a witness in the house of God? So also I wanted to throw in there 1 Corinthians, but I'm shifting back to the King James because that's my, that's my way. Man, I like, oh, oh Lord, I'm King James. And I, <laughs> now, when, when, when Dr. Siddiqui started talking about the King James, I started thinking about changing the version. But, but anyway, I, I don't know. I, just, I, just, I grew up on this. I cut my teeth on this. So here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, starting right there. And this we'll use this all the time for our communion service, which we need to do another one of those soon. I think we've missed a month or two, uh, maybe perhaps at least one. So check this out. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For, uh, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Listen to this. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, who, who in the body of Christ, who in the world, who in the kingdom of God could not get some, some very powerful meaning out of that verse right there? We, we all need to examine ourselves. This examination, look, if I tell you about you, I promise you you're going to get mad. And, I'm gonna, and, I'll, and I'll admit it, when you check me, when you call me out on my stuff and you check me, it bothers me. It makes me mad. <laughs> Amen. Nobody wants to get told nothing about themselves, not from each other. So therefore, what did God do? He said, well, hey, bad boy. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, amen? amen. Get yourself a checkup from the neck up, amen? <laughs> Let the Lord jerk all the slack out of your chain, and he'll give you the ability to look at yourself. Every time I point at you, I got three fingers and a thumb cocked back at me, amen? amen. No wonder the Lord's word says, if you think you're standing firm, take heed lest you fall. No wonder he says that pride and arrogancy go right before, you know, destruction and a fall, right? And then he talks about how that, uh, how that we, we desperately need to let this scope, right, penetrate our own soul and then use the power thereof to renew our minds and make better choices for our life. You know, I enjoy multiple years of sobriety, but I promise you it doesn't make me some super saint. My multiple years of sobriety is my multiple years of sobriety. It is for me and my household. 
It, it blesses my family, and of course, it certainly gives me a voice with you. I mean, if I was, if I was up here right now and I just binged and smoked about $1,400 worth of crack last week because I got my stimulus, uh, you would probably have a little bit of trouble sitting here for, for the rest of the service. If, if, I, if I confess that right now, you'd probably say, I, I think well, I'm out of here. See ya, you know. I'll just go watch TV somewhere, with, you know, or, or whatever, 100,000 whatevers. But it, it, it does give one power to be able to say, you know, I mean, I've even wondered sometimes, you know, because, you know, you can't, this is the way the mind works. I mean, the enemy, he's always trying to find a niche. He's find, trying to find a, a, a nick or cranny somewhere. So I hear this voice sometimes, and I know it's not God. He says, well, you think with all them multiple years, maybe you'd get to a place where you could have a little social sip? Maybe a little champagne with your wife on anniversary time or something? And this is what I hear overwhelmingly inside. Oh, it never worked. That's what I get inside. That's what comes right from here. Right out, out, of the, out of the belly flow rivers of water. Living water. It's like a wellspring. Springs up into everlasting life. Pushes the filth out. It's like, it's like, it's like a fresh blast of water coming in a spigot. Because, you know, dust is settling right now. I mean, we can't see it, but there's dust. It's all around us. There's dust particles. So if there's a little spigot here, you got a little water fountain, put your mouth down to that, that when you push that fountain and that blast comes out to you, push all the little dust particle, push it on out, and then you get your drink. <laughs> That's the way it is when you examine yourself. Good Lord, he'll give you wisdom. That wisdom wells up inside. No is a whole sentence. Oh, well, wait a minute. I came to church. I don't want to hear that recovery talk. Church is recovery. Church, church is recovery slash restoration. It's a place of wholeness. Everybody's recovering from something. Or they should be. Yeah. I mean, something to recover from. Some people are recovering from grief, from sorrow, from anger, from violence. You know, I was a drug addict, a massive alcoholic drug addict junkie, stuck on stupid for 25 years. Half of it in prison, the other half in the dope, in the spoon. Come on, somebody. The half, the half time in prison saved me. Hello. Yeah. But the only thing was, was I wasn't changing much till I got Jesus. And, uh, man, the, the truth is, is that uh, I was angry. I didn't even know what I was angry about at first. But, you know, had, my brother was kind of abusive growing up, one of them. You know, he was kind of mean to me. That, so I, that was an excuse. I'll show them. And then also, also it was glamorous. There was a glamour part of it. I mean, when I was a little boy and, it didn't, and all I wanted for Christmas was my two front teeth. Couldn't say, couldn't say, I couldn't pronounce the P in police very well. So I used to say, I want to be a feesome because I couldn't say policeman. So I said, I want to be a feesome. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I remember how that when I started watching those old black and white gangster movies and I saw old, old Maul Barker and old Clyde Burr and I saw old pretty boy Floyd and pretty and, and machine gun Kelly and baby face Nelson. Man, they made them, they all was resting and dressing, had them old fine cars, man, and, and the, the women all over them and, and, and all that money. And I thought, man, them Tommy guns, I thought, man, that's the way to go, man, right there. The, the Hollywood made the police look bad, made the gangster look good. And I bit the hook, man, ran with it. Wouldn't, wouldn't, it. wouldn't even have been a good wannabe. I mean, not even a good little pimple on the backside of one of them bad guys. And yet I run the, run the gamut and ended up in prison repeatedly. And it was all a farce. It was all just a big plastic joke. But it wasn't a joke, the effect it had on my life. And then God, oh, you know, Mama's prayers, Daddy's prayers, because I don't talk as much about Daddy's prayers, but let me tell you something. He, they were married. They loved the Lord together. She, she just seemingly loved him more. That's all I can say. But, but you know, she, she, she would always get him to agree with her, and he was like that. He agreed. Yeah, save that rascal, you know. Do something with that hook. I don't want him in here no more. He's a thief. He's disrespectful. Somebody's got some kids like that. Oh, yeah. And you still love them. Oh, yeah. And some of, some of you might have been kids like that. And you're still loved. I'll guarantee you're loved here. 
I don't care who you are dialing in here in person or otherwise. We, the people of Cool Ministries Incorporated, being delivered from what God delivered us from, we love you. We love you in Jesus' name. And we do not hold your past against you, and nor do we want you to continue to suffer. We want you to be healed. Healed and filled and set free by the power of the living God. That's what we're experiencing here. That's what we want everybody to experience. Whether it's multiple years or just a desire, doesn't matter. There's no respect of persons in Christ. No respect of persons. He doesn't have more love for somebody that's going to be 28 years clean in four days than he has for the person that's hiring a Georgia Pine right now, dope sick or something or other, or, or freaking out and thinks everybody in here is a cop. Uh, you know, come on. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Amen? All right. So let a man examine himself before he drink, breaks that bread and drinks that cup. Amen? All right. Oh, I... <laughs> Okay, so now verse 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Do you think that when a person examines himself, that maybe it might be vitally key and very important to discern the Lord's body in this? I mean, did he not go to Calvary and suffer and bleed and die to take away our sin? Was that not the main reason that he was born? Was he not born to die? Did he not go to that cross to take care of business? Did he not himself break down in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweat drops of blood from his brow as he seeked the face of God to say, Look, with you, Father, all things are possible. If it be possible that this cup pass from me and I don't have to drink the dregs thereof, I just assume that happened. Nevertheless... Not my will, but thy will be done, which means that Jesus himself set in course the example of us being willing to incorporate the will of God into our decision making. As we examine ourselves, can I get a witness in the house of the Lord? Amen. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Many sleep out of depression because they won't examine themselves. They're depressed because of the choices they made and the actions they took and the things they did. Don't think I haven't been there. Don't think I haven't been so down on myself I couldn't get out of bed for three, four, five days at a time. Don't, don't kid yourself. I was a junkie. I know what it means to be sick like that. I know what it means to be severely depressed because you have spent every resource imaginable and then resources you didn't even have like in advance of anything you might get later to maintain something that was just being blown away from you every time you got close to it. You're chasing a feather in the wind. They're dangling a, a, a carrot in front of you like to, to just trick you and, and play you, pimp you, play you, not pay you. The devil, the devil, the hater of your soul, the one who cannot stand the reality that God wants to hang out with you. And somebody says, well, you sure seem to talk a lot about that. Well, that's where I came from. That's what I was delivered from. That's what I was set free from. So why wouldn't I speak about what the abundance, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth is speaking. And I, and I, I, I long to help a suffering addict. I want to see somebody that is continuing to struggle. They are all around the pool. My God, they've been here for years. And they've never got in the water. You know, Jesus walked up on a man that was down, he, down by the pool of Bethesda. Uh, miracles happened when the angel stirred the water. And he laid there for 38 years. And I know people that's got that much time and even more in the crack, in the alcohol, in the opiates. Hello, somebody. And Jesus will walk up to you just like he walked up to that man and say, Will you be healed? Will you be set free? And the guy says, Well, I ain't got nobody to help me. My God, ain't got, everybody left me. My, you know, my mom and my dad, and, and everybody just left me, left me like a dog in the street. I ain't got nobody. And every time the water started, they, they get down in front of me. They're rude. They're rude, Lord. He didn't want to hear a word of it. He said, Pick up your mat and walk. I thought, my God, why would, that's not very bedside manner, Lord. Why are you just telling me, you know, get up and go? Why do you got to pick up that old nasty mat? I, mean, I can't imagine. I, I mean, come on now. I have some friends that stay on the streets, and, and after they've been out there for three, four weeks, man, 
I'm thinking, man, can we just get a hose and hose them down, put some clean clothes on them, throw some suds on there, man. The poor brother needs a bath. And, and I realize I'm not stupid. I understand that when you cake up enough dirt on yourself, it's protective. I get that. That's one of the things they tell us about the hand sanitizer. It kills 99.9% and it makes everything, all, all the good bacteria that's, that's designed to protect you is now taken off of you. Hello, somebody in the house of the Lord. You know, I, I like to be clean, you know, but, but I, I'm not going to hate on somebody because they're dirty. But my God, I see them how dirty they are. And I think, so I wonder how messed up that mat was. Does anybody think that mat might have been a little bit messed up? 38 years? Think there's a chance that mat might have been nasty? I can almost see in my mind what the guy might have done. I, I can just see him get up off that mat and pick up that mat and just put it in the pool and say, hey, all of y'all that step down in front of me, clean my mat off a little bit here. See ya. You know? Now, I, well, we might not ever see hear that, but I'm just saying, I'm trying to think what the story might look like. <laughs> One thing I know, when you get busted and you go to the county jail, the first thing they do is to, you get you through process they pick up that mat and walk. <laughs> And you know, the funny thing is, is that when you pick up that mat and walk, Jesus is never far away. Oh, he's in the jailhouse. People, some people say, man, every parent that has a kid that's in trouble says, yeah, they all find Jesus in the jailhouse, huh? They give them the Bible now on commissary at the county. The Harris County Sheriff's Office will give a free Bible through the commissary. That's, that's uh, COVID results. Any, any inmate can get a Bible now through the commissary. Come on, somebody. Prior to COVID, you had to pay for it. You could get it, but you had to buy it. How, how much does a soup cost in the county jail these days? 91? That's highway robbery. They, they better put a case on the people that put the prices on that stuff. Let them buy some 91 cent ramen noodle, 5 cent, 10 cent soups. Well, at least Eddie B., he gives them free soup. Come on, somebody. <laughs> All, right, All right, so now um, let's see here. For if we would judge ourselves in 31, we should not be judged. I want you to remember that one because, man, I tell you what, I, I got some friends. And, and these days, these, day, these tattoo parlors and stuff, man, I, it's expensive, my grandson showed me one. He had like a, like a full sleeve there. Well, you know, not not full, but just forearm sleeve. I, it, man, it was over a thousand dollars. I said, "My gosh, I can't get the tithe off that." I told him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But. Um, some of my friends, they have expensive art and ink, and it says, only God can judge me. It might be right across there. It says, only God can judge me. Style and profile. Amen. Huh? Only God. But God says, judge yourself. Now, ain't that something? I'm not, not hey, if you got that, if you spent... Salute you, but come on now. The Word of God does say that you should judge yourself. Examine yourself. I mean, it's not, we're not trying to throw no rocks at nobody. It's all good in the hood, but, but at least take heed to what the Word says because the power of God is inside of the believer to help them examine themselves. You remember, you remember the verse, right? Jesus said, as many as believed upon him, even the name of Jesus, God gave them power to become his children, right? Amen? But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So according to the word of God, here as we read this, according to the word of God, there's great value in the examination of self. How about this? Uh, Y'all know the serenity prayer, right? Most of us would know that from Hollywood and movies and some AA meetings, right? 
what it says, God grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? Okay, good, right? That's good. Everybody say, that's good. How about this one? God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the person I can, and the wisdom to know that person is me. Right. Let's get some self-examination going on here, okay? All right, I need to get out of your business, get in my own business, right? And keep it on the I statements. You know, I was reading my Bible one day in Seg. Well, I wasn't really being punished, but I was in transit, so it was like Seg. <laughs> you couldn't get out. You was locked up 23 out of 24 hours a day. That's Seg to me, amen. I was segregated, amen. Come on, somebody. And so I was reading my Bible in my cell, and all of a sudden I saw the word sin in the word, and then it got real big. I saw it just leap off the page, S-I-N. I said, whoa. And then, and then the, the S and the N went back in. The I stayed big. And then I heard these words, when I do what I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do it, I always end up with an S-I-N, a state identification number. And I had multiple numbers by that time, so I, I knew it was true. I knew it was true. I needed to do some self-examination. I needed to quit using everybody else as an excuse why I wasn't doing something different. If every convict in the place was still in bleach, as bad as I liked my whites tight, if I was going to serve Christ, I might need to quit stealing with my hands and do something to build the kingdom. And maybe just ask the captain, can I get a little bit of bleach to, you know, wash my tennis shoes and my gym shorts and my, my boxers and my shirt, you know? Are you with me? Can you hook a brother up, Cap? <laughs> Something like that, amen? Or, in some cases, sometimes another convict would they'd steal so much of it, they'd say, hey, let, here, here, take care of your stuff. That's still kind of, in a way, it's kind of around town, but not quite the same. <laughs> Just saying, amen. Hallelujah. So we never rise above the level of the company we keep. Now, that was a hard one for me, because the Bible says, be not deceived, bad company corrupts good character. But then a wisdom key that we've learned about in, in the kingdom of God and around town is that you never rise above the level of the company you keep. It's the same thing. It's just a little word, worded, you know, word, worded different there. But um, it's true. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I, in, in, giving, in giving, I've heard that, uh, let's see, how do they say? For wealth, give up, and for healing, give down. Something like that. So you, 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 could, you could actually kind of discern which way you were going to give. Because sometimes when you give, hello, you give to people that are pretty prosperous, ministry-wise and things of that nature. Can I get a witness in the house of God? I mean, all ministry in the kingdom is, doesn't seem to be at the same level. The church of Philippi, according to what we know, biblical history-wise, was not a really rocking, thriving you know, mega church. It was more of a smaller congregation, and they would give, they would chip in together and send little uh, morsels of food, if you will, to the Apostle Paul while he was locked up in a Roman penitentiary, a place called Mamertine, bad place. It's where he wrote the letter to the Philippians at. Interesting. So anyway, there's just different levels of what you could give, I guess, if you will. Um, in our cool Christ-centered 12-step recovery restoration program, we have a step, uh, step four that reads like this. We make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and ask the Lord to show us what needs to be confessed, repented of, and forsaken in Jesus' name. Now, Acts 3, 19 and 20, which I did not give my folks in the booth uh, on this particular run here, but they, the, the actual scripture in Acts 3, 19 and 20 says, Now turn from your sins and turn to God so you can be cleansed of your sins and then wonderful times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will send Jesus, your Messiah, to you again. Now, isn't that, isn't that a wonderful verse and isn't that a wonderful truth? So now, step four cannot happen 
in a believer's life until he's accomplished the belief system that's necessary in the first three steps. The first three steps are very simple here. I can't, God can, and I know I'll let him. This is the born-again experience. And every believer has had this experience. They might not say, yes, I did step one, step two, and step three. They may not say that. But they may say, I went to the Lord, and I heard the convicting word of faith, and I, I came to my senses, and I, and I went to the altar, or I kneeled down right where I was, and I humbled myself before God, and I opened up my heart to the Lord, and I received Christ to be my personal Lord and Savior. Bam, same, same difference. I can't, God can, and I know I'll let him. In secular recovery, we said, I think I'll let him. They said the same words. That's where I got the words. I can't, God can, and I think I'll let him. But the same people said, our best thinking got us in trouble. And so I said, well, I, I hear you. I feel you. Hey, hey, man, but I think I better keep my thinking out of this mix when it's come to faith. Because the Bible says that the carnal mind of a man is enmity against the Lord, hostile toward him, ain't trying to hear him. And if you really look up, if you really look at your own life, if you'll examine yourself right now, you think about your mental attitude about God, and even about what you might know about faith. And I'll guarantee you, if you're thinking of it from your mind's point of view, you're you're thinking some stuff that's way whack from what the Word of Faith is and, and says. There's uh, there's there's little or no humility in it. In your way of thinking. Without God, without God, ever say without God, my mind leans prideful. Because it does. It really does. That's the Bible teaches it. The Bible says that the carnal mind of a man is enmity against God. No wonder some of the most brilliant people that you've ever met in your life. When I say brilliant, I'm talking about they might have a drug problem. And they might have an alcohol problem. But when it comes down to the wire, these are some talented, skilled, gifted, very intelligent, articulate people. Some of the most crafty, awesomest, baddest to the bone, artistic you ever met in your life. The, the Prisons are filled with talent like that. I mean, that's why we go in there. We're looking for treasure in the darkness. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not kidding myself. Somebody came in there and found me in that darkness. Hello, somebody. Come on, somebody. I went in there and found a few. Come on, holler back. Thank you, Jesus. Because, <laughs> you know, you got to pay forward now. Amen. Come on now. You ever been in the line at a Chick-fil-A and you walk up, you get up to the window and they say the, the car in front of you paid you for years too? No. <laughs> well, I call favor, favor, favor on all of you. Right, right you. Not... <laughs> Pastor Bill said y'all going to ride with me. <laughs> all right. So step four is a great opportunity, if you will, in this process, this, this whole thing that I got. And, of course, you know, this is not like an infomercial. Let me tell you something. People do, do absolutely support work like this by supporting and donating fees or money, whatever, to, to have this in their possession. I, I, I really, honest to God, on the World Wide Internet, I could care less about any uh, financial gain off of it. What I would really like to see is for people to get it into their hands. I'd like to see people that are suffering and struggling with drug addiction and alcohol problems and families of, the family members of. You know, there's so much codependency and hurt in people's lives, and it lingers on, and it causes all kinds of friction in homes and families and with loved ones. I just pray that this could be an instrument of blessing and peace and healing and deliverance for people everywhere. But step four in here is a great opportunity for you to write your story. And let me tell you something. If you're a believer in Christ, I really double-dog dare you. Write your story. There's thousands of people waiting to hear what God did in your life. And you might say, well, I don't have... Some people, some of my friends say, well, I've never been to prison. That's a testimony all by itself, folks. Let me tell you something. It is a blessing that you've never been to prison. Those of us that have been to prison, we're glad you've never been to prison. We hope you never go. You, you can bank on that. Can I get a witness in the house of the Lord from uh, people like me? Stronger. Stronger. <laughs> Stronger amen. 
<laughs> Amen. It's a grand opportunity to write your story. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.31 again. Just one verse, but look at this again. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Well, I mean, I, I guess nobody around here is probably completely out of whack with this. When you're dealing with each other, when we're dealing with one another in the kingdom of God, and things happen, now we don't, we don't live our life like we're judge, jury, and executioner, but everybody has an opinion about something. And, and we vibe different. We, you know, one of the worst things that I see happen between good people that love each other is what gets lost in a text or, or an email or a, the, the verbiage. Sometimes it just makes you feel like, what are they trying to say? I mean, like, you throw your, hold your hand on your hip. What are they trying to say? <laughs> and really, it doesn't have to even necessarily mean that they was trying to say anything. It just might be that we're not vibing right with the emotions that went into whatever they wrote. Amen? And so these things are noteworthy, right? And, and it's really necessary that we judge ourselves and, and tap that power in Christ and take a look at ourselves and say, well, what are you doing? You know, God, God asked Adam in the... Garden in the what part of the day was that, Pastor Bill? The cool of the day. Oh, my gosh. Cool made Genesis? That's right. Lord have mercy. Yeah, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was. He talking about, oh, I heard you coming, and I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that tree? I told you to stay away from that tree. And then, and then the snitching started going on. That's where snitching started, right there. They call it getting down first. That woman you gave me. That woman you gave me. And that's what people have been doing ever since, passing the buck. You know, uh, look, I talked about it last week. I've hit on it a little bit today. The truth is the truth that my brother was abusive. I have an older brother. He was abusive. He's in heaven, and I thank God for that. And I love him, and if he was here, I wouldn't even say these things because it would be hurtful if he was here to hear them with his ears. And that's just the way it is. That's just the way life is. When I wrote my story, I did my step four. I didn't know I was doing step four. I was writing my story. I write my testimony in the county jail. I wrote 26 and a half pages on a tablet that I bought from the commissary with them old hard stick pens. Man, I've still got calluses on my fingers from using them old hard pens. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, I wrote my story, and I, and I really graphically described everything that he did. And then when I got to thinking about it, the Lord, so, the Lord told me and impressed upon me, rewrite that and take all that incriminating stuff out that you wrote about him. You can hit on it in a general way, but get on it and get off of it quick because he's still alive, and I have need of him. And I said, wow. So you love that rascal too? And he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. More than you know. More than you know. I shed my blood to save him. I said, okay, then. So I obeyed. Took all that incriminating stuff out. But I used that abuse from him to stay in my addiction, and I used it to hold on to my pride, and it was my excuse, and it was my leverage, and I could play that card with Mama and Daddy, and it was always good for 30 or 40 or $50. I mean, I could always get, a, get another 20 at least another 20 <laughs> Amen. Just by pointing my finger at him, just like old Adam was pointing at Eve, you know, that woman, you know, that brother, that brother you gave me, you know, that's the reason. Hello? And you know, at the end of the day, that's hogwash. That don't hold no water in the kingdom. I had need to examine myself. What was I, some rock of Gibraltar? Was I all that in a bag of chips? Did I not need the Lord's grace and mercy on my life as well? Look at the hurt I caused my parents because of that. 
and many other people in society, which I never, even though I'm a prison missionary, I never make light of the people that I minister to behind bars and the hurt that they caused people and, and victimized and things of that. As a matter of fact, uh, the people that I minister to, we often, often we pray for the victims of our crimes. And we ask God to bless and heal them everywhere they hurt as a result of the horrible things and actions that we took and the pain that we caused. In Jesus' name. And see, hurting people hurt people, so a lot of times this stuff is repeated and it just goes on and on, and this is the way things go. But see, as much as that's true, it's also true if you start doing good. That'll have that same ripple effect, and it'll start carrying on. It's like, it's, the, the Lord showed me it's like reverse domino effect. You know, when you think of domino effect, you think of one domino, knocks the next one down, right? As much as they can put out there, right? But if you look at it in a reverse factor, those dominoes are standing up. God can heal those relationships. He can bring things back. That, that, and and, it, and even, when, even when they're gone, even when that person has expired, they have left this earth there with God, hopefully prayerfully, then, then obviously, we, you and I, have the power in Christ to receive healing in our soul by the pure act of we are willing to forgive and release and be forgiven and be released. Amen. Forgive and release is one of the most powerful weapons God gives a Christian. If you're going to examine yourself today, you best be, be inclusive of forgiveness and, and the power of God to release that into his hands and to quit being bitter and resentful about it. And you may have every justifiable reason in the world to be mad. If we heard your story, if you got up here and you took the mic and you, you began to spill out all of the hurtful things and the despicable things and the, the rejection and the, uh, the, 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 the abandonment, the things that people did to you and the thing they falsified and took from you and stole your inheritance and all kinds of stuff that happened to you as a person in your family, I get it, I'd be mad too. But you have to know that God is bigger and better than your pain, that he's head over heels in love with you, that he can heal you everywhere you hurt. And all that matters right now is you and him. Because when you stand before him, it ain't going to be about your brother, your mom, your dad, your sister, or anybody else that hurt you or what you're upset about, your wife, your significant other, your husband, your whatever. You've got to stand before God, and I have to stand before God, each and every one of us alone. We're going to be there naked before him in love. And he is going to say, look, man, I got you. What would you do with my son? And he knows. He already knows the answer. This is an open book test. He's, got, he's, he's keeping score, but he's got an eraser. He's keeping score on the board, but thank God our father has an eraser. He says, I'll remove it as far away from me as the east is from the west. And I choose, I, I believe this is what he's saying. I choose not to hold, to remember it anymore. If you're created in his image and after his likeness, and you are, and you have a memory, but you have power not to hold things that you remember against someone, is that not kind of like what you think maybe about God? He, he knows everything. I mean, Aren't you glad that he chooses not to hold that against us? Yes. I'm not talking about the bad stuff, you know, years ago. I'm talking about just like this morning, trying to get to church stuff. Hello? You know, I heard a minister say, man, Lord, you know everything. I, I've sinned in my mind ten times while we're having this conversation. You know? Hello? Just if you're doing any thinking at all, right? Can I get a witness? <laughs> I'm, I don't know how you feel about this message, but I needed it. I need to examine myself. I need to examine myself every day with his scope, the scope of his word. Who in the world do I think I am? Amen. I need the Lord. I don't need to be prideful. I guess, I guess if, if, I, if I wanted to feed into that, I'd be you know, strutting because I'm going to be 28 years clean in four days, which, which is meaningless. I could fall right here. I don't even have to go out of the room. I don't have to go get a can or a bottle of anything or put fire to a pipe or, or knock the bubbles out of a syringe. I don't have to do none of it. Jesus said if you did it in your heart, you did it. 
It's a greater law. It's a finer line. Can I get a witness in the house of God? So you don't think more highly of yourself because God's blessed you and you've been able to maintain something. Thank you, Jesus, for the maintenance. Thank you, Jesus, for the power. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. But I am nothing without you. I cannot even breathe without you. I can't lift a finger without you. I can't preach without you. If you don't show up, there's nothing here worth staying for. Hello, somebody. But I know he loves you. And I know he's got a plan for you. And I know he can heal you everywhere you hurt. And I don't give a flying flip how many times you've messed up. This is your day for the miracle. This is your day for the miracle. You're one decision away from changing your life forever. You're one decision away. I made that decision on April the 29th of 93. Best decision I ever made. I told the Lord, I will not drink again. I will not stick any more needles in my veins again. Within 14 days, I was offered all the free, folk, all the free cocaine I could shoot on a pod at 13, uh, what was that, 1301 Franklin, 8C3, Deputy Foote's private little congregation of convicts. You can have all the free cocaine you want, boy. Just roll that mop bucket on that special detail team over there to the lieutenant station and grab those packages and bring them back over here, and we got gotcha. you. I said, you ain't got me. I put that punk to death about two weeks ago. Killed him on my knees in the city jail. Put him to death. I'm standing in front of you, resurrected life in Jesus Christ. They said, boy, you was one throat off, white boy. You better get on out of here. You better bump it on down now, boy. I said, yes, sir. I'm shaking. I said, if you ever want to know about him, just let me know. I'll tell you all about him. I pushed my mop bucket right on down the run there. They kicked me out of 8C3, though. They didn't let me stay. <laughs> Praise God. It's okay. God's wanting to help people get in, not keep them out. I want to tell you that. Said it last week. Say it again. Got that from Dr. Siddiqui, by the way. God's not trying to get people uh, to push them out. He's trying to get them in. He wants to draw them in, not push them out with all that legalistic religious stuff that the Bible warns you about. It says the letter of the law kills, the spirit of life gives. The, spirit of, the letter of the spirit gives life, life and peace, life and peace. There is a peaceful manner that God wants to utilize to draw his broken children to his arms of love. Let me tell you something. We want to empty hell and populate heaven. That's our goal. That should be our main focus. Let's empty hell and populate heaven. That, that was Reinhard Bonnke. And he, oh, he, had a, he had millions of souls in his little crawl there. I mean, that's pretty, that's, it's hard to wrap your mind around. All you got to do is Google it. You do pull a Eddie B and Google it. Google it, Google it. Put the lime in the Google. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so let's go back now to Hebrews and let's look at chapter 12 and look at verse 1. This is um, really part of our foundation here, by the way. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The sin. See, without somebody telling you what that is, if you do some self-examination, <laughs> the Lord will reveal exactly. You already know anyway. He's already been speaking to you. You already know. It ain't about somebody examining you. The, 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 Erica fixed me a slide today with a, a magnifying glass, self-examination. <laughs> That's, we need to do that to ourselves, amen, and just listen to the voice of the Lord and quit being so prideful. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. Humility is what's left when we rid ourselves of pride. <laughs> Humility is what's left. <laughs> when you rid yourself of that prideful, arrogant, like you're the big shot, know-it-all, you know everything. Ain't nobody can tell you nothing because you know everything. 
That's what's wrong with you. Hello? Bump it on down with your know-it-all self. Get Jesus today. Get Jesus today. Let him love you through some stuff. That's what happens to those of us that well, were broken before him in love. We serve a God that's not broken anymore. He's a risen king. That's what the, that's what the songs say. Because he's risen, I'm not a broken man anymore. And I used to use that before, I, he, before Eddie wrote that song, uh, Broken Man. I used to use that quite often in my talk to people. I said, I'm just a broken man. And then he said, well, I'm not a broken man anymore. I said, hmm, and I got looking at that. And I think, I think, I said, well, that's word now. That's word. Because Jesus takes all your broken pieces and makes you whole again. So you can proclaim that, right? And then he says here, Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Think about how important it is that you and I refuse to faint in our minds, especially in these trying times that we've been living through. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Can I say amen to that? And I bet you can too. And you have, uh, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you, as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Look, there is a certain thing that happens to you and me in faith when we move away from the anointing. There is a conviction that comes upon us that could easily be played by the enemy to be converted to condemnation. The enemy wants to take anything that God has and taint it. He can't, he's not an original. He, 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 can't, he can't create anything. He can only deceive and mess up. You know, he can just pollute and he can, he can mess up what's already created. You, you, you distort it. That's right. He can distort it. That's what he does. That's the card he plays. So his version, if you will, of love is hate. Now, there is a pure hate. There's a, there's a good hate, really. If you, if you, if there is. To love God is to hate evil. Hello. That's in the Bible. Right? But, but when the enemy gets to play in that thing, he'll have people divided against each other. And that's not God's way. I mean, look at us, man. We are a beautiful blend in here, man. Thank you, Father, for this church. And, and what you've done here and how that we, are, we stand together. We don't use our differences to put each other down. Amen. We thank God for every culture, every, every race, every color, every creed, every national origin, every belief system even. We thank God he draws people from everywhere into his arms of love. Everything comes together at the cross. The cross is the key. Thank you, Dr. Carlin. The cross is the key, the key to the vertical relationship that we have between us and God and the horizontal relationship that we share with one another. What we have with God vertically is best expressed horizontally. Hello. Come on, somebody in the house. For whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receives. Ouch. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. In the Bible. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more, much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. 
will you just simply, child, son, daughter of God, will you please just let the Lord heal you? Just be healed right now, whatever it is. If everybody's recovering from something, and we are, then let the healing flow and let the, let the good times roll. Let the good times roll. Let the healing flow. Let us be taken to a new place we've never been before. God is not a God who takes us back to where we were. Now, you might have been singing in the choir back then, and you might have, been, you might have had more giving contributions in that year than any other person in the church with, with, with actual you know, giving transactions, right? And now you haven't given in so long you forgot what it feels like to give. And God says, I got you. I'm not taking you back to that. I'll take you to a new place you've never been. Amen? Amen? That's what it's about. It's about God restoring you, God healing you. When I think about my own life and my own time in the work of the Lord in the kingdom, in the ministry, and I think about some of the things that I deal with around here, which is other people's drama, just to be curt with you. And that drama cakes up and it gets on me sometimes. And then I start feeling a pinch of it and I feel a little tainted by it and I get, a, I get to a place where I'm in a hard spot and I start feeling depression, trying to get on me. And then, of course, I always hear the Lord and he says, hey, shake it off and step up and give that to me. You cast that over to me right now because I care for you. Then when I obey him and I do what he instructed me to do, and I just, it's almost like getting up under something that's heavy and shoving it over to him. Is it, you know, just as much as you can. And sometimes you need somebody to help you. Sometimes it's so heavy you need somebody else to step in and stand with you. And I think that's what it means to withstand the, the wiles of the devil. Amen. And you heave and you hoe and you shove it over to the Lord. And you know that he cares for you. And leave it where, where it is. Leave it over there. Don't, don't walk out of the church. I'm going to get me some of that. I'm worrisome more. I'm going to be worrisome. That's what you, some of y'all worry so much, and that rest of us ain't got to worry. You got us covered. <laughs> Is this helping anybody? Verse 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace, peace. Follow peace, peace. How do you follow peace? Peace that can come through forgive and release, peace. Peace like a river. It'll guard both your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. You can have peace in both places. Peace, peace. Man, Pastor Jim Scalise, who was a spiritual father to me, that one, that bad boy, he had some peace now. He had peace. He just, he just out of the clear, just peace. Peace. <laughs> I could almost see. But anyway, peace is valuable. Peace will guard your heart. It will guard your mind. Amen. Peace comes from God, and you can follow peace like an umpire calling the shots in a ball game. You don't have to give in to anything. If it's not peace, it's turmoil. The enemy's version of peace, his perversion of peace is turmoil. It's like fight or flight. It's like adrenaline check. It's like, flow, it's like, man, you're ready to tear somebody's head off. I mean, it's not good. If you follow peace, that's God. And he'll give you peace like a river. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness should be avoided at all costs. We should have no strife in our team. First and foremost, we need to build teams. We need better teams around here. We need every man, every woman finding their right niche in the kingdom of God, in the household of faith, and everybody finding their right place, and then let's chip in and let's do our, let's do our part. Let's make it happen. You know, when I, when I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll get graphic with you. We need, we need greeters. We need, we need hospitality hosts. We need people in the AV department. We need them in the sound booth. We need them in the worship team. We need, we need people that, that can uh, vacuum the floors and clean the chairs and put the cards and the envelopes on the backs of the chairs and make sure the trash is all taken out, make sure all the food is rotated properly, make sure that if anybody has anybody that they have knowledge of that needs some of that food, look, it's better to give that food away than it is to throw it in the trash. 
The food comes to us for the purpose of helping somebody. We need to be about helping somebody as long as we got it. Now, if we got enough people helping, pretty soon we might not have enough food. Then you know what I believe God would do? He'd probably just start revving it up and sending it a little faster. I don't believe you and I can outgive him. Do you believe that? I don't believe we can outgive him. I believe that we're better together than we were alone, and we need teams. And if we're going to have teams, we need to stand against strife. If we're going to stand against strife, we need to stand against bitterness. And if we think that somebody has slighted us some kind of way, pull the brother or the sister to the side and have a one-on-one -on -one between you and them and say, look, I'd just like to clean this up if it's possible. What did you mean by sitting in my favorite chair? Who do you think you are? Why did you take my parking place? You know I park there every Sunday. Whatever the, you know. Because it's usually, usually it's real silly, simple stuff that could just be smoothed out real quick. And they might tell you, hey, you don't own these chairs. And them parking spots are for anybody. Who, first come, first serve. Then that might be a learning curve for you. Oh, they are, they are for everybody. <laughs> Hey, man, <laughs> all we got to do is just park somewhere else or sit somewhere else. Don't worry about it. Oh, that's reserved for the pastor. So what? Let the, let the lowest person in the house, the one who's hurting the worst, let him sit there. And love on him, give him a bottle of water, hook him up. Let the pastor stand. That boy ain't done nothing. He ain't shit. <laughs> hey, man, are you with me? That's what you do, man. Just do it. Build some teams. And then let's see here. Let's go to Romans, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's not like somebody in here hasn't, you know. We all have, and we've all come short, but God, see. And then Romans 10, 8 through 11. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See? There you go. There it is right there. See? You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. Some people, some people believe in their heart. I couldn't tell you how many times in a prison I've done an altar call, and men respond by throwing their hands up. I mean, almost like right away. You have any, I haven't even got all the words out, and they're like this. And I'm trying to, you know, count them on the cool and everything, you know, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, like that. And then all of a sudden, we start praying. And I say, repeat after me, and they're sitting over there like this. They won't move their lips. I said, well, why don't, I'm thinking in my mind, I ain't got time to break it down. You need to confess this with your mouth. I've just got to roll through it, but it breaks my heart because they're not getting it. You've got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You need to have it in both places. Amen? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then the scripture says in verse 11, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I think it's really interesting when a child of God messes up anything. And when I say messes up anything, I mean sins any kind of way. When a child of God, man, woman, or child, sins against God and against their self, the first thing the enemy does is try to bring shame on them. Shame. Shame so powerful, it'll keep them out of the fellowship. I'm too ashamed. I can't go over there. I'm ashamed. That's what, he want, that's what he did to Adam and Eve. He wants to bring that shame, bring that shame, bring that shame. God says, look, look up, child. That sounds like Lauren Daigle to me. Look up, child. Look up. Look up from whence cometh your help. When you look up into the eyes of a holy God, he says, look, everybody on the planet has sinned and fallen short of my glory. Look up to me. I will draw you in. There is no shame in Christ. But you know what some people do? Because of the pride in their mind, they say, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, what, that's, why, that's why I continue to do what I do because it's all good. Pop that top. Pit, twist that cap. Roll that doodle. Put that fire on that pipe. Lord, knock them bubbles. Oh. No, that's, you get the wrong message. You've, you've, you've twisted it. 
you look up so that you are empowered to examine yourself and stop doing that. That's how we get clean. Not by mental ascent of so much pride that nobody can tell you anything because you know everything. Let the word of God be true and let the rest of us be liars. Amen? Can, we're quiet up in here. Is it okay to, to try to reach that person that's stuck in that rut? Is it okay to try to reach that person who can't keep that alcohol out of their body? Who can't keep that crack out of their system? Who can't keep those pills out of their mouth? Is it okay to try to reach them for Jesus today? Maybe they're watching us somewhere on the other side of the world. You know, the rampant drug addiction around the entire planet. Hello, somebody. Oh, when you get uh, all of that, you get, you first hear the word of faith. God draws you by his Holy Spirit and then he blesses you with like precious faith. So let's look at 2 Peter 1 and 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And then let's go to Romans 12, 3, where it kicks in and it says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So every believer comes in with the same measure, but all men don't have faith. All men don't have faith. I can prove that. Uh, let's go to contrast that with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may delivered, be, be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil, and we have uh, confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition that he, which he received of us. For yourselves know how he ought to follow us, and for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, and neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travel night and day, that we might be... Uh, not, not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Uh, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. They are all up in everybody's business, they have a strong opinion about the rest of the body and the work that they do, right? And they, they, they kick up and they, 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 they kind of like fan the flame of strife and division and, judge, and judgment in the wrong way. Come on, they're not judging themselves, right? Come on. And they're busybodies. Now it says, Now them that are such we command and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now, we've heard that over and over today in the past couple of weeks. Do not grow weary in well-doing. So if that well-doing is you that you've been at it for a while now, keep, keep on. And if you're just getting into the decision-making time that it's time to get into, into the groove and start doing something good, then just don't be weary. Don't let yourself grow weary. Especially on the initial front, because at first the enemy will come as, oh, like a fool. I mean, he'll come at you with everything he's got. He swings real wild. Now, any of these old gunslingers in here that got a little, a little uh, penitentiary day room game knows that you can just sidestep and look for that button. If you just sat, just weave and bob, just get out of the way. Get them, get them old bees out the way, and then, then come on with it. And if you can get them good right on the little chinny chin chin. You pinch them nerves and he's out. Everybody going to root and holler, David and Goliath, David and Goliath, amen. <laughs> you still got some fight in you. Come on, somebody. 
But the enemy is like that. He comes at you with everything he's got, and he's real wild, and all you got to do is just stay focused and say no. That's, that's the best blow you can give. No. Not going to twist off. Not going to go sideways on my brother. I'm not going to cuss that person out. I'm not going to feed into this negativity. I'm not going to be depressed. I am not going to use. I am not going to abuse. I'm done with this. I need something better in my life than another binge. Amen. 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 Can I get a witness? God's in love with you. He's in love. He is in this house. Oh, he is all over this room. He's all over out there wherever you are in the world. I mean, we got people watching us from all over the United States and all over the world. Thank you, Jesus, for every one of them. However many or however few there are, we thank you for every one of them in Jesus' name. So, you didn't have to come up with a list of sins, see, you didn't have to come up with that at all. Every breach of the Spirit, all you are required to do is admit that you have sinned and fallen short of His glory. Um, verse 14 there says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means the lord be with you all so then why examine your life any further did the apostle paul say to forget was what was behind he did say that right in uh, philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 the bible says not as though i had already attained either were already perfect but i follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if any man, if, any, in, if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now what I love about these verses is, first and foremost, it is important to forget what's behind and press on. In other words, there's no past in the future, however, everybody say however, the waves of yesterday's disobedience splash on the shores of today for a season. So whenever, whenever you or I have sinned and messed up, there is a season by which you're going to feel the pinch of that as things begin to straighten out. Jesus said it like this in the book of Galatians, be not deceived, God is not mocked, you will reap what you sow. Now, he can't just do away with the principle of sowing and reaping just because, you know, you're desiring to forget what's behind and press on. So, in other words, okay, I got out of prison almost 23 years ago, and I had an electronic monitor on my leg, and I had to report every month, and I had to be at a home visit, and I had to do what they wanted me to do, including UAs and otherwise. So I couldn't say to them, well, the Apostle Paul said, I forget what's behind, and I press on, so I'm not coming to see you, and you don't have to come see me, and I ain't peeing in no cup. Because all that would mean is that I would be in jail and back in prison for a technical parole violation, that, a blue warrant, which would come to me because I was violating my parole, which was a privilege, not a right. That make sense? So you can't use the scripture incorrectly. You have to rightly divide the word of truth and then apply it accurately. So I forget what's behind. I press on. But the waves of yesterday's disobedience are splashing on the shores of today for a season. So I had to wear the monitor until they cut it off. And go to the par parole and report until it was done. And finally it was done. And I thank God it was done. But even if I was still doing it, I could still be doing this. To the, to the extent that I could do it. You know, I was signing people's paper for, for them coming to a recovery meeting when I was still on parole. Amen? And they even let me go back to prison while I was still on parole. And that was a miracle to me. I had to dance for that. You'd have thought I was Fred Astaire. Jan was ready to give up and just throw in the towel. She said, it's just too much. We've tried for two years. She said, they just don't want to let us go. I said, no, don't give up. Don't give up. Stay with me, honey. Stay with me. We've got to stay with it. 
Got to stay with it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We're going to serve our king behind those walls. Do not grow weary in well-doing. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Now we've been there for a long time. Well, I mean, for at least 12 years, we knocked on the sheriff's door. We want to come to the county jail. We want to come to the county. They said, oh, you. They said, Jan, maybe you. Oh, no way. Mm-mm. We ain't let no aggravated fool up in here. <laughs> I said, well, the place is full of them. I'm just one more. I'm, I'm reformed, amen. I've been changed, amen. I've been washed. <laughs> Finally, we got in there. So glad, so happy, so blessed. Okay, well, I've, I've, I, I ask your forgiveness for all the stories I tell. I, I, I might get out of hand with that sometimes. I do apologize, but it just, it just comes up, you know what I mean? I get to thinking about these things. But um, okay, so let me ask you this. In light of everything that we have discussed today, do you believe in your heart that it's good for you to examine yourself? Amen. Is that a fair thing? It's, it, it's not a hard word. It's not, it's not somebody dipping in your business or calling you out on anything. It's just opening your heart and your mind to God and asking him, show me how I can use your power to examine myself and make some better decisions for what lies ahead. Did you get the message today? Was it worth your time? Thank you all so much for dialing in on the internet. And I just want to bring this on into a landing place now. And this is the most important part of the service really and truly. Because we want to ask you, we want to ask you face up, either here or out there on the internet viewing platform uh, of the social media platforms that we go to, if there's a single soul either here or out there that just needs to make peace with God for the first time. Now, you could have been around God forever. You might know more about the Word than I know. That I, don't, I really, honest to the Lord, I don't believe you'd have to know that much to outdo me. I just, the grip I got on the bit I've got and then the grip it has on me has changed my life. So I'd rather know less and do something with what I got than have all that theological knowledge and don't do nothing but argue with people and, and cause hindrances for them, you know? So I'd just rather be humble before the Lord and say, look, I'm in my lane. I'm in my space. And if you're out there or you're in here and you need to make peace with God, this is your opportunity. Examine yourself. Open your heart. Let God's light fill your soul with peace and joy and faith and hope and love. And, and you can't come to him unless he draws you. So if you're feeling that pull, that's God. That's God. That's the only way in. You've got to feel that. You've got to just feel that draw, man. God just draws on your soul and brings you into his space. And he loves you. Many of you are backslidden, perhaps, and you, you just really need to return to your first love. That's also a form of self-examination. Just to realize, look, I'm, I'm, I'm undone. I, I see the train of his glory fill this temple. I look at myself, and I'm undone. I need him to release angels from the incense burner there and touch my lips with one hot coal and purify my mouth let every word that comes forth redound to the glory of the kingdom of God and be reconciled to him today that's a gift all by itself from God to you if you are like so many of you that I know you really are you're strong in your faith. You love God. You're strong. You read your word. You, you say your prayers. You're always quick to give a person a reason for the hope you found. Just add your faith with our faith. Add your faith with everybody else's faith wherever they are. And let's let God do what only God can do. Only God can save. Only God can heal. Only God can deliver. God is the one who gets all the glory for every salvation and every healing and every miracle that happens in the kingdom. In Jesus' name. So let's pray together out of our own mouths, our own hearts, with our own mouths out loud and say this with me today. Say, Lord, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I repent of my sin. I denounce Satan. I rebuke the devil. And I ask you, Lord, Come into my life in a deeper, more meaningful way. Take back all the ground, Lord, that I've given to the devil on every level. I crown you the Lord of all. And in the name of Jesus, I serve notice on the devil now. Devil and demon forces, get out of my life. I'll not serve you anymore. Jesus is my Lord. And I'm going to serve him with my whole heart 
now and forevermore. And now, God, you're more than my God. You're my heavenly Father. And I worship you in spirit and in truth all the days of my life. Fill me full of the Holy Spirit. Give me the power to keep your word. I commit to you. I will read, study, and obey everything you say each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Family of God, this is my part. It's a priestly blessing. Please keep your spirits open big and receive the priestly blessing now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace his love and power and healing and restoration and deliverance. And may he bless the work of your hands and give you favor, favor, favor everywhere you go. May God go right before you. Open up all the right doors. Close the wrong doors. Keep the right ones open and the wrong ones closed so that you and I can enter into the deeper flow of his love and provision for ourselves and our families as he prevents us from making any further mistakes. No more error. But you and I together receive the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls, in Jesus' name. I'm Pastor Boyd Harrell, coming to you from Cool Ministries Incorporated in Northwest Houston, Texas. Please stay tuned for more, as we'll come back to you soon. Come and be a part of it if you can. God bless you. We'll see you next time.